Um, we will now hear from Natasha Gore. Natasha is the executive director of the Echo Network, a social capital nonprofit dedicated to helping others build trust across lines of difference in Winston-Salem. She has also held positions at the American Cancer Society and at the Greensboro Historical Museum. Here you go, Natasha. I'm gonna say right here, I'm a podium kind of girl. Um, well, I've really enjoyed being here and, and hearing everyone's stuff. Uh, for those that would know me, I, I feel really vanilla right now, I'm really uninteresting, but in my normal life, people would say that I'm not the vanilla one in the group, so I hope that, you know, I was saying to Lynn, wow, she's got the breathing, yeah, this, wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyway, um, so before I get started, you'll see that this says Social Capital and Echo and Facebook. Uh, this is not a talk about how to use Facebook to strengthen your social network. This is a talk about how social capital um, and, and, and affirming social networking tools as a legitimate and sometimes preferred tool in building social capital. So it's good to be at these types of events because when I talk to people, they kind of get what I'm doing and understand when I say social capital. Uh, but I do want to go over a little bit of the history of the social capital movement here in Winston-Salem because it'll give you some context about some of the things that I say about uh, Facebook. So uh, Echo goes back to the late 90s when social capital was a new buzz phrase. And, and I can't say that the phrase is necessarily caught on to the mainstream simply because I still get a lot of blank stares when I tell people we work on building social capital, but there are pockets of recognition here and there, especially in this type of um, environment and room, that surprise and delight me. Um, social capital was a concept popularized by Robert Putnam in an article he wrote called Bowling Alone. I'm sure many of you have heard of that. Um, just a brief pause. Does anybody here bowl? Yes? Okay. I just want to put this out there. I bowled a 160 on my Christmas vacation last year. I'm only telling you this because I've never done that before. I'm a horrible bowler, and my husband was the only one that witnessed it. So I'm just, this is the biggest venue. I'm like, 160, yeah, all right. Uh, so anyway, um, so Do Dr. Putnam noted that during a certain time period in America, there was an increase in bowlers, but a decrease in bowling leagues. For some reason, people were choosing to do more things in isolation. They were doing more things like bowling alone. And in essence, we were declining in social capital, which in a nutshell is the benefit that we can all create and use only by developing and maintaining trusting relationships with one another. So hang in with me. Hang in with me. I'll try to get through this boring background as fast as I can. So in 1999, the Winston-Salem Foundation, which is a community foundation here that makes grants, provides scholarships, and manages charitable funds, decided that it would focus some of its energy on building social capital locally. So they started the ECHO Fund. ECHO, for those of you who are not familiar, stands for Everyone Can Help Out. They dedicated $2.5 million over five years for grants to promote social capital building, particularly of the bridging variety. So for those of you who are well-versed in social capital, you know that there are two primary ways that you can build social capital. One is bonding, which is social capital built among people that are like you, whether that be your gender or your race or your age or socioeconomic background. And the other is bridging social capital, which is the social capital built among people who are unlike one another. So about a year after the foundation started the ECHO Fund, Winston-Salem was able to participate in a national survey to measure social capital, led by Dr. Robert Putnam. Forty communities all across the country participated, including Greensboro and Charlotte, so there was a, a pretty wide span of communities that, that had a chance to measure their social capital, and there were some communities kind of like ours that we could compare ourselves to. As you can imagine, there were some social capital strengths identified here in Winston-Salem as well as challenges. Just to highlight a few, Winston-Salem was found to be high in faith-based giving or faith-based engagement and charitable giving. I'm sure that's not a surprise to those of you who live in Winston-Salem and surrounding areas. And Winston-Salem was found to be low in social trust, interracial trust, diversity of leadership, and protest politics, among a couple of other things. So, at that time, and remember I said that the foundation had started a fund and dedicated two and a half billion dollars. 
They, they figured that their investment in grant making towards social capital probably couldn't make a noticeable dent in our community's challenges in that area. So they convened a think tank and called it the Echo Council. The council began meeting in 2004 to come up with a plan to engage all of Forsyth County in relationship building in one way or another. Eventually, the council, having created and implemented programs, segmented into committees and work groups, as many types of these types of initiatives do, evolved into its own separate nonprofit, the Echo Network. We've tried quite a few initiatives over this past uh, eight or nine years. We'll continue to try various things to get residents up and out of their regular network um, and connect with folks that they normally wouldn't encounter. So, that's the background of there. Let's get back to social capital because it's important to lay out the definition that we've been using for about a decade. Social capital is the benefit we gain from connectivity, whether that be tangible, intangible, connections in your community. You know, not a question that you need to answer out loud, but how many, uh, how did many of you hear about this event? Just think about that. Um, you know, I was invited to speak, but if I hadn't been, I probably would have read it on some email or seen it on Facebook. I'm sure some of you read it in some publication online, no doubt. You saw a link to the site from a friend's social networking page. Yes. Um, so essentially, social capital is all the good stuff we get just by knowing and then trusting, because that's the key point, someone and having them trust you. That stuff could be information like, hey, come to the TEDx conference. Uh, to make life easier. It could be connection to jobs. It could be connection to uh, future important people in your life. Or it could be just a feeling of safety, love, and acceptance. So I get asked this a lot, and, and I don't know if, if this data is still true because this was back in 2000 when the survey was done. But people always ask, so what communities are high in social capital? So keep in mind, this information is based on the communities that participated in the social capital survey. So here are four that I decided to pull out. Bismarck, North Dakota, rural South Dakota, Montana, Seattle, Washington. And not every uh, community that participated was a city. Sometimes there were larger areas. Okay, so you ask what communities are low in social capital. Again, this is just based on the 2000 figures, but as you know about how things change and the pace of change, 12 years isn't necessarily enough time to, to change that. So here are places that were cited as low in social capital. Houston, Texas, Boston, Massachusetts, LA, San Diego. What do these things have in common? What do these places have in common? Big cities. Um, so what does it mean to be high or low in social capital compared to the rest of those surveyed? What I think it means and what I've read it to mean is that uh, smaller communities have an easier time building social capital. It's not to say that a large community or a large city like Houston, Texas, cannot have a high level of trust among its residents, especially in smaller segments, but that in small communities, building trust among its residents is an easier task to tackle, just considering the numbers alone. So what I think about that, especially when I think about my job and the daunting task of connecting people, is that it's good news for Winston-Salem, because we're not too huge of a community. There's still time and energy and capacity for us to help build relationships across Winston-Salem. So as I'm going about my job telling people what we do and what social capital is, people, and I'm not saying people in one particular generation because it crosses generations, are always making broad statements about how isolation and social networking is killing relationships. That isolation due to online activity. And these are even people that I would consider my social capital building peers, the people that I look to for advice and ideas about how we're going to do this next thing better. They will say that things like Facebook only perpetuates isolationism. And Microsoft Word didn't underscore that as a non-word, so I'm saying it, isolationism. Um, I'm not in college anymore, so I, sometimes I don't know what's a word and what's not a word. So, you know, I, I think about that a lot, and I, in the beginning, I didn't challenge it. You know, let people have their opinions. Okay, yeah, you're right, it's really great, and Facebook's really bad, and we, we shouldn't rely on those things to create our relationships. But is social networking really an isolated task? Um, so if you're at home, and another person is at home, aside from the telephone, how would the two of you connect? 
Doesn't modern phone etiquette dictate that there be a reason or need to call someone? Maybe with the exception of kids calling grandma. I know I don't pick up the phone to call someone and just, hey, what's going on? Yeah, nothing. Just calling. Love you. Mean it. Um, <laughs> so social networking, on the other hand, is a lot more flexible. Um, wouldn't you agree? Therefore, making it easier to connect. Now, before I praise Facebook, for the record, I do want to acknowledge the power of the face-to-face. -face. I'm all about the face-to-face. -face. Getting to know the real person, getting to know the person in front is so important. Voice inflection is so important, especially in this time of miscommunication. A face-to-face -face encounter makes it easier for you to gauge if someone's interested in you and what you have to say. Um, and that, I know, is important for me. I'm always kind of gauging, like, okay, are they shifting? Are they looking away? Do I need to pick up my pace? What am I saying that's boring them? Or maybe I'm just the only paranoid one. Okay, you guys are all perfect. So, and, you know, of course, seeing that familiar face across a crowded room like this can put you at ease. So I just want to put out there that I do believe in the face-to-face. -face. It's, it's extremely powerful. But what leads to the face-to-face? What brings us to the face-to-face? -face? If you don't see someone on a regular basis, online or otherwise, how are you prompted to connect with that person? Do you generally connect with people that you see regularly? For me, the answer is yes, because those are the people at my job, those are the people at the organizations that I volunteer with, those are the people that are at the establishments that I frequent. But what about those people that you've only met one time? Do you set a date if you're interested? Some of you might. Um, I sometimes bother my husband, James, with friend anxiety. Friend anxiety occurs when I've met someone I really like and I want to connect with them, but I don't know how to make the next move, especially if it's unlikely that we'll cross paths again. And so I'll be asking him, you know, while we're having dinner, like, yeah, she was really nice. Should I call her? You know, should I suggest dinner or drinks? Or, what if she doesn't drink? Or God forbid, what if she doesn't eat? You know, <laughs> and his response is, you know, he's, he's chewing his food and he's like, yeah, just call her. Men, I mean, they're so easy. <laughs> and, and harder still, how do you connect with those that you've met many times? Um, consider a friend, but um, maybe you run an entirely different circle than them, so therefore you would hardly see each other by accident. I'm sure you all have lots of people like that. So enter Facebook's role in building social capital. So all of my accolades are based on the newest the newest old version of Facebook, not Timeline. I know someone mentioned Timeline. And uh, for those of you who are Facebook users, so if you go to your own profile, if you're on the newest old version, you look closely at the sidebar friends on your profile page. These rotations are not random. Maybe you have realized this already. I only noticed it about five months ago. I started going back to my own page every day to see how the list had changed. Facebook chooses select people to put on the list, not just the ones that you communicate with the most, because lots of people have said, oh, well, it's probably people that go to your page or like your photos or, you know, interact with you. No, it's not, because there are people on there that I'm like, I haven't went to their page and I'm pre I don't know why they would have come to my page. I don't know. Um, and I've read and researched everything I could find in order to crack the code about who filters into this list. Haven't found anything definitive, but I have come to a conclusion. I think, and my question, you know, and what I would answer to this is, is Facebook reminding us to, reminding us not to forget these people? Is Facebook encouraging us to strengthen the relationships we already have? So shortly after this re revelation, I shared my thoughts with another Echo staff person who questioned, why would Facebook care if you strengthen relationships with a small group of people? And I'm sure many of you know, and especially those students out there, you probably have, you know, 1,500 friends or whatever. Well, this is just my conclusion, but I think that the people at Facebook know that what keeps us coming back to their site are those meaningful connections that we cherish. It's exactly why Facebook designed features to allow us to hide those people that we friend obligatorily. Those people that we really don't care about, but we're going to have them on our page because, oh, it's so-and-so, and I want to really continue the connection just in case she can give me the job hookup in a month. <laughs> Facebook knows that the only reason we'll return is if someone or something we cared about is there. They want us to strengthen these relationships with other active Facebook users who happen to be our friends. And I'm sure that you've noticed that Facebook does a little matchmaking, connects like activities to determine who you should connect with. It doesn't mean that the person will be like you, but it means that they will share a like in common. 
Yes, it means more money from them, for adver from my advertisers, but that's how business works and our relationships benefit from it. So, you know, let's face it, one of the beauties of Facebook is that you can quickly scan someone's life or profile for similarities before you dismiss them as being unworthy of your friendship. Can that happen in a simple face-to-face? -face? Is there even time for that? It's not likely. And not unlike cyberstalking, which I'm not condoning, but I do acknowledge as a means to an end, Facebook, <laughs> Facebook allows you to browse someone's life for what your connections may be, connections that might surprise you. So in December of last year, um, I was telling a friend when we were eating lunch at the break, um, I had this horrible incident where my purse was stolen and my phone was in there and, and my Facebook accounts were connected along with a million other things. And so I freaked out and I turned off my Facebook account and then I realized I kind of needed a break. So I took a 60-day face, face break. And it wasn't designed to be 60 days, but I knew that I needed a break until I was ready to go back. So when I did return just a few weeks ago, I discovered something horrible. I actually did forget some people. When I went to my page, I was like, oh, I totally forgot that person existed. So I guess some would say, well, maybe they're not supposed to be in your life. But I would argue that they are supposed to be in my life. And the only thing reminding me of that is Facebook. Because I'm too busy and closed off for this person to end up in any of my fast-moving, homogenous circles. And I'm sure some people forget about me too, and let's hope that they were happy to see me return. So here's what I'm concluding. Uh, Facebook and sites like it is, it's the only place you can run into someone from every one of your circles, regardless of how different they may be. Can you think of any physical location that you're gonna run into someone from every one of your circles? The grocery store? Unlikely. Um, so that's a value to social capital and goes beyond social networking. Social media is, is a modern tool that makes global relationships possible and it makes local relationships flourish. Maybe I'm off base about Facebook's structure, or maybe I'm right, uh, or maybe I'm just hardwired to build social capital so therefore I see the potential in everything. Either way, if you happen to meet me during this conference or otherwise, please friend me. I don't mind that we've only met once. Uh, because truth be told, I don't know if I will ever see you again otherwise. And let's be honest, how many conference roster books have you pulled out lately that you can follow up via email with fellow participants? I didn't think so. So lastly, just two plugs, one is shameless. The first one is please visit uh, echonetwork.org to find out more about what we're doing. Um, I didn't have time today to tell you about some of the projects that we have going on. It's very exciting, some great things for students to be involved in. I would love for some of you to help these efforts in building social capital. And the, the second, which is the shameless plug, is come see me in Avenue Q through March 11th at the Theater Alliance. I play Gary Coleman. Natasha, one quick question yeah. that I thought of. Um, I noticed that you said one of the places that does have a high social capital is uh, rural South Dakota. That's where the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation is. Do you, uh, did you find any information as to why some really rural areas, maybe even poorer areas, have higher social capital than places like LA? Because they were more homogenous and it makes it harder to build social capital when there's even a perceived difference. So a lot of those rural places were all of the same race and all of the same religion. And so when you have a place that's more of a melting pot or a mixed salad, whatever, you know, um, then it's a lot harder to start breaking down those barriers and building relationships. They have a stoop. Exactly. We all need a stoop. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you.